Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, a podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Maslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. This episode is brought to you by LMNT Electrolytes. This month, we're switching it up with an exclusive offer that's only for VIP LMNT partners, including Carnivore Cast listeners. You can now receive this free sample pack along with any regular purchase when you use my custom link, which is provided in the show notes or my Instagram link in bio. That's drinklmnt.com forward slash Carnivore Cast, all one word. And as I said, I'll include the link in the show notes. LMNT electrolytes are convenient evidence-based and delicious and get yours today to help support the show. Thank you. Dr. Sarah Zaldivar at dr.sarah.zaldivar on Instagram is a nutrition professor at Miami Dade College, holds a PhD in exercise physiology and nutrition, and has an incredible YouTube channel, search her name, with amazing interviews with carnivores and more. Welcome to the show, Dr. Sarah. Hi, Scott. Thank you for having me. Yeah, very excited to speak with you um, and would love to just start with learning a little bit more about you and your story. You know, how did you get to where you are and um, yeah, more of your personal health journey? Sure. So I really started um, veering off the mainstream at a very young age. When I was 18, um, I was struggling with adult acne that wouldn't go away and I would see every single dermatologist on the planet. And, um, nobody had a clue. I mean, the only thing that they would do is just literally just prescribe the drug after drug and every single one would fail. And then they would just, I mean, I've, I've done spironolactone, birth control pills, antibiotics for three months. I don't know what happened to my gut from that. <laughs> um, Accutane twice made my acne worse. I actually started oh. having thick acne for the first time. And I sometimes wonder if, I, my depression also was triggered, triggered from that, you know, because one of the main risk factors for, uh, or one of the main warnings is that it increases the, the, the risk of getting, um, depression and suicidal like ideation and stuff. So very serious stuff. So <laughs> did all that didn't work. And that was around the time that, um, like the internet was starting to have more, um, information that's that was around I would say 2005 to 2000, between 2005 and like 2007 is when I really was going through the ringer with my skin. Um, so and in those years too, I had just started my bachelor's in nutrition and dietetics, and <laughs> I was being taught to eat more carbs and mm. less fat, and I was trying to do that, and it just made everything worse. Oh, no. So. Yeah. And it was like, I grew up in Lebanon, by the way. So I, I moved uh, and became an American like in 2012. And then, you know, I met my husband and all that stuff. But, but basically I lived all my life in Lebanon. Right. And I did my bachelor's and my master's in nutrition and dietetics over there. And, um, and so nobody could figure it out. I, I would be very depressed. I wouldn't want to leave the house because of my skin. I wouldn't go on dates because of my skin. <laughs> It was like really horrible stuff. Um, and then I would pick at it. I would make it worse. So eventually I would Google all kinds of stuff and I like spent a lot of time nerding out and reading blogs and stuff. So eventually I came across Dr. Lauren Cordain's book, The Acne Cure or The Dietary Cure for Acne. They changed the title, I believe. So, but back then it was called The Acne Cure. Um, and uh, it was even like before you had Kindle and all that stuff, I had to. Hey, I, I, and in Lebanon, it's also like harder. So like I had to go to my bank and get a card, pay them the money that I wanted for them to put in that card so I could use it, you know, so I can purchase something online. Wow. That's, yes. <laughs> and so they, and then they sent me via email, the whole PDF version of the book. Okay. So from that, I learned that diet is pretty much what is causing my acne. And he was talking about how hunter-gatherer societies had no acne, even their teenagers had no acne. And uh, he was talking about how important it was to go back to eating a paleo diet um, and eliminate you know, the grains, the beans, legumes, and dairy. So I did. 
And lo and behold, in one month, which is exactly the timeline he gave, he's like, by the end of the first month, you'll have clear skin and you'll start seeing actually improvements by in the first seven days, which also was true. So I, so that I was sold, like, obviously, but I was still doing a lot of fruits because I was just doing paleo, but it wasn't like emphasized that it needed to be like animal based. It was like, Mm. just cut out those three food groups where you can have fruits, you know, and of course, you know, (laughs) I'm going to have fruits if nobody tells me otherwise. So I was still doing a lot of carbs that way. And so for that reason, I feel like I could have achieved like complete remission had I completely eliminated the fruits, but I didn't know it back then. But still, the improvement was drastic, you know, and I was sold and beginning uh, that was like really the beginning. And then I also struggled with my weight and um, trying, you know, to do the calorie counting thing that I was brainwashed with in dietetic school Um, that didn't work. And eventually I came um, in 2012, I, after I graduated with my master's, flew to Miami and I did my PhD in exercise physiology and nutrition at the University of Miami. And, um, and it was, that was around the time where I was still kind of like in survival mode because I didn't know anybody really in, in the States. I literally came, I flew in on a one-way ticket <laughs> Wow! And, then I, and I had only like $2,000 my mom was like, that's it. That's all I can give you. Like, you have to figure it out. You know, it was like rent for the first, but I mean, you do get paid as a doctoral student. So yeah, but, barely. But still, <laughs> barely, barely, exactly. And when you don't have any support, it's very difficult, you know? And then in the three months of the summer, I didn't have a job because they only paid you like for nine months, which barely covered the bills. And then I had no idea what was going to happen after the first nine months. But thankfully, I don't even know how, like it worked out. So, um, so it was, it was a little bit of a survival mode then. And that was why I wasn't a hundred percent paleo around that first year. And so my skin still went back and, you know, I was struggling with it. Saw more dermatologists at the university of Miami and everybody was like, I I still remember this dermatologist in, in, uh, in Miami. I think he was in South Miami and he was, and I, went to see him and he and I asked him at the end of the consultation because he seemed like just like every other dermatologist dermatologist I've seen you know just wanted to give me drugs and so uh, I asked him do you know what a paleo diet is no no I asked him what what do you think about the paleo diet and his answer was what is that (laughs) (laughs) there you go (laughs) no idea yeah so after that first year I met my future husband. And so things got a little bit easier. And so, you know, I could now like I moved in with him. And so I wasn't as stressed for a cash. I wasn't in survival mode as much. And so that was when I really started to focus on more things like diet and weight, weight loss and stuff like that, because I've always also struggled with um, being a little overweight. Um, and so because of that, I am and being a nerd, I would watch all the, you know, YouTube interviews and read all the books in the documentaries. And that's how I came across keto. And from there, the, you know, plant paradox, Dr. Stephen Gundry. And then from there, eventually Sean Baker and the carnivore diet. So, and I, and it was all like, good. Uh, the, all of those were steps in the right direction. Like, I feel like the moment I, 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 um, uh, did keto, I stopped getting sick. I used to get sick all the time, like always having the flu. Um, and then literally ever since I quit eating the carbs, like seriously, it's been nine or 10 years now that I haven't had anything, like not even a cold, no flu, nothing, which wow. is mind blowing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and yeah. at, along the way, as you were learning, it, it's, it's funny how like our own health scares can just breed an unsatiated desire for learning. (laughs) Um, Like nothing motivates you to learn and seek answers like problems with your own health. Um, So so I'm I'm curious, how did that, like there must've been some cognitive dissonance with learning those things about your own body and about Mm -hmm. um, nutrition along with what you were learning in school and studying in your PhD. So how, how did you, how did you deal with that? And what was that like for you? Well, first of all, in Lebanon, I didn't have the luxury of having cognitive dissonance. I was like survival mode. (laughs) You know, it was just like, I, 
like after I finished my bachelor's in Lebanon and I couldn't find a job and my only other option was to go live in some um, Arabic country like Dubai or whatever. And I'm a very fierce feminist rebel. Like I am a, I'm a rebel. <laughs> you know? I, I, I cannot deal with authority figures. Yeah. And people would be like, no, no, it's fine. You can go to Dubai. It's super modern. And then I would see my friends there, like they'll have a selfie in a Dubai mall. And and I know obviously Arabic because it's the language over there. And like the sign would say that, you know, you have to pay attention to what you're like, what, what you're wearing. Like you have to be conservative. Like, oh, they have no. to, like I can't, I yeah. cannot live in a country where I have to see a sign like that. Yeah. It's so I, yeah. So I literally had a nervous breakdown because I knew, okay, I did my bachelor's. Now what? I, there's no way I could live over there. I couldn't, I, I couldn't. And so, um, I did, I had a nervous breakdown. My boyfriend dumped me and, um, <laughs> that's when that was like, oh, my I'm sorry. Was the blow. Oh no, it's, it was the best thing that ever happened because that's when I was like, okay, no strings attached. I'm out of here. That's when <laughs> I put that plan in place. I was like, okay, I had just started my master's the first semester, but I was like barely applying myself. Cause it's like, what's the point? And the moment, um, and the moment I was free of that relationship, I there was zero reason for keeping me in Lebanon anymore, right? And so that's when I was like, and that's literally the same. That was around the same time. Once it hit me, like I could do my PhD, I snapped out of the depression, nervous breakdown, whatever you want to call it, staying in bed all day, eating nothing except a glass of whiskey and one chocolate muffin for a day. <laughs> for months on great end. diet great diet <laughs> it was a great diet that's true so um so the moment i had a like a new vision and i said okay great now i have something to look forward to this is actually something that i would want to do um i'm gonna i'm gonna kill myself and finish that masters in record time and uh, while at the same time um you know applying to get my uh applying to different universities because they didn't know how easy or difficult it was be it was going to be for me to get a, a PhD uh, a, a, like approval. So I applied to four different universities, and I needed the assistantship. I needed to have financial assistance. So I would every single penny I saved to study for the tests and to apply and all that stuff. And I got approved. I got a, like admitted to all four universities wow. with yeah with full you know schol- not scholarship but assistantship you know like yeah. a stipend. Amazing. Yeah, it was super cool. So. So why did, would it, why did I go into all of that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was asking like, as you were learning about um, nutrition through oh, your right. education. Well, I, oh, right, right, right. I had no luxury, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. After I came to the States and then I, I stopped living in that survival mode, that's when, you know, you start focusing on additional things other than just making it to the end of the month, you know? And that's when I started um, really digging deep into the what we were learning. And I was, and by the time that I realized it was all BS, I was so close to getting my doctorate. I was like, it was it was hard to finish it because I I knew I wasn't going to be able to work in the system. Like this is BS. Um, but uh, but but I kind of stuck to this. Like I hung in there, you know, um, to finish it. So, but yeah, I was already stirring trouble at UM, <laughs> so, like, you know, having arguments with doctors who, who had no idea that you had different subtypes of LDL and, you know, making mm. scenes and stuff. So it was, it was a, it was like, like the perfect timing. I was done with the PhD and fine. And I was already ramping up like the YouTube and the per, building the personal brand so I could do what I do without, you know, having to explain to people why it's crazy what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's awesome. So if I understand correctly, you both coach and teach now, is that correct? Yeah. So I teach at Miami Dade college. Um, and I have clients, um, I don't advertise, advertise too much about the client stuff. Although sometimes I can't help it when I get like results and stuff. Oh my God. I said this morning, just this morning, uh, I literally just began working with a 55 year old menopausal woman. Woman, wow. um, yeah, and uh, she she not only has lost like like I don't know like five pounds in one week, but she's like you're you're not gonna believe this. This morning, her email was like you're not gonna believe this. I 
I'm, she's menopausal. Like she doesn't get her period. She's like, I just got my period. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? That's so Regulating cool. your, your hormones. Yeah, exactly. So like, I can't help but share those kinds of stuff. Yeah. So, but yeah. Uh, but, but the main focus is like, you know, hustling with that YouTube channel, <laughs> growing it and, you know, Instagram. This episode is brought to you by Optimal Carnivore. Many people I talk to struggle to get enough organ meat on a carnivore diet. There's debate about whether you need to eat organs or not, but I like to supplement with organ meats and it makes me feel better and many carnivores would agree. Optimal Carnivore was created by carnivores for carnivores. In fact, I was consulted during the formulation, which is pretty cool. Um, They have a unique organ complex that combines nine different organs, liver, brain, heart, and more. Um, all from grass-fed, grass-finished animals in New Zealand. And taking six capsules a day is the same as eating an ounce of raw liver. Um, and it's it's completely freeze-dried, and they use a very high-quality process to retain all the nutrients. You can use the link in the episode description or um, the link in my Instagram bio and use the code CARNWAR10 to save a checkout and support the show. Thank you. What are some of the things you like to focus on with with your content and your coaching as well? So I, it's not like I have a strategy. Um, my main goal is to grow the YouTube channel by obviously talking about things that I'm passionate about. But it's not like I want to be known as the carnivore doctor, and I will yeah. only talk about like no, 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 sure. no, no I don't. I, yeah, I cannot. I, I can't. I hate when people box you in. Yeah, and you know, like. For me, I love fashion. I love lifestyle issues, stuff, um, dance. I have dance videos on my channel, but the the bulk, the bulk of the content, be, just because they get so many views and people and so many subscribers, and also because I mean, I I get excited when I learn something new, when I share something new about that. Yeah. So I so I talk a lot mainly about the carnivore diet, but it started out as just you know nutrition and fitness all the stuff that I already am obsessed with, like fitness, diet, anti-aging is huge. I also really focus on that. And that that will always be a huge, I I would say probably my biggest passion is anti-aging because it's like, Mm. what's the point of anything if we're going to (laughs) die? Well said. Exactly. Yeah. That's really cool. And um, what types of people do you coach who like, what types of people do you like to work with? Do you, what kinds of things do you help people with? It seems like women gravitate most um, Mm -hmm. towards me. It's not like I prefer to, you know, I I work with everybody. It just seems that um, women are definitely the ones that make up the vast majority of my client clientele. Um, and mainly they want to lose weight <laughs> and <laughs> they struggle because I talk a lot about my struggles with binge eating and emotional eating and sugar addiction, all those things I've struggled with. Um, so they gravitate towards me when they're struggling with that as well. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of those things? Like what, um, sure. what has it been like for you? Well, <laughs> where should I start? <laughs> um, I've struggled with sugar addiction all my life. I'm growing. Well, let's, let's bring it back to when I was born. Okay. (laughs) So when I was like four months old, my mom had to leave me with my, um, uh, grandma and aunt and like my, my maternal, my maternal family side, because I was born in 1987, like around the end of the Lebanese civil war, so there was a, there, there was a 15 year civil war that wrecked the country. Mm. Um, and from 1975 to 1990, I was born in 1987. Okay. So it was, the war was still raging. And so, um, because of that, for whatever reason, they, my mom couldn't take me back with her because my dad's business at the time, um, he was working for his dad because my grandpa was like a multimillionaire, like made all his money, I guess, from the oil. I don't know where, like, but in Kuwait and that boom, you know, when that gold mm. was, yeah. So, um, so my dad's business was there. So she had to go with my dad. Um, and they, for whatever reason, something was happening with my papers. I'm assuming because of the civil war, whatever, mm. they couldn't take me. So she, she left me, um, there for like a year and a half. And, um, I, at some point stopped wanting the formula and, mm. um, because like my aunt, I mean, my aunt, she, 
like it's not her responsibility or everybody else's. So they were like, okay, just give her condensed milk. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> I was given condensed milk for 30 days until my mom found out about it and like lost it. And yeah. like, I give her that. So I'm probably that's where it all started. But okay. Regardless of why, um, growing up, you know, eating rice and beans and all that kind of stuff. And then starting with very early on, um, having issues with body image. I think I was maybe like 12, probably 12 when the first time a classmate of mine told me, oh yeah, you're fat. Oh. <laughs> I still remember exactly yeah. who he was. And uh, that's when like you start having all kinds of complexes from a very young age. And I yes. started going on diets and paying attention to what I ate. And I remember begging my mom so much and crying so that she would take me to, uh, to see a dietitian. So at 14 was the first time I saw a dietitian back when they were still working. Well, actually nothing has changed, but <laughs> back then it was the food guide pyramid where you have at the base, you know, all the carbs and the grains and the yep. cereals. We used to eat carbs, but it went like it became even worse after I started seeing the dietitian because now my mom would also be in this consult with us and be like, oh, so this is how we're supposed to eat <laughs> more pasta, more yeah. rice. Oh, I mean, out of control. So, <laughs> so that didn't work. I, I remember yeah. not even putting a pound with her, nothing. Oh, wow. um, but but this, the, the, you, you always blame yourself. You always feel like it's probably because that extra meal that I had, it's why I didn't lose anything, you know? Um, so you always blame yourself and you always keep trying and trying and trying and it never works. Um, and then when I was like a teenager, I developed severe uh, eating disorders where it was um, really bad. Like uh, I would literally starve myself for like a few days as Oof. long as I could. Um, I would, I would though eat the digestive biscuits. I don't, so in Lebanon, we get a lot of European products, but I do have them. They do have them here. I've seen them. The McVitie's um, digestive, if you've ever had them. They're the yeah, I've seen those. Buttery. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Somehow I thought that that was healthy too. I guess they were marketed that way. Okay. <laughs> so I would have like a few of those biscuits, but other than that, nothing. Yeah. And of course, I mean, you're not eating protein, you're not eating real food. So eventually I would like, just collapse and eat everything and i would do it because it was so much um so it wasn't like socially acceptable like i would wait and i would do it in hiding mm -hmm. um like a whole jar of nutella i could eat mm -hmm. that in one sitting wow. to the point where my brother bought like a locker and <laughs> would hide the nutella and then I eventually i cracked it and i would able i was able oh to my open gosh. it over back again wow so yeah, like, like that's real sugar addiction. Yeah. So I would do that. Um, and I got to a very, very heavy weight. I was 60 kilos when I was 18. That last year of high school was at my lowest point and my heaviest weight. I don't know what, what is 60 kilos? Let's see. Um, like 135, I want to say. Ooh. 132. Pretty good math. Though. Okay. <laughs> that's just a guess. Not bad at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's huge. I'm five feet tall. So, you know, for my frame, that's, that's a lot of extra excess body fat. I probably even more than 60, because I don't, I don't think I, at that point, I just couldn't face the scale. I probably even hit a heavier number. Mm. Um, so from there is like my, my, all of my battles really with weight and eating disorders and binge eating. Um, but then, you know, a lot of it also had to do with like my, like it's, it's a cycle. Like I would restrict binge and over time that drove my weight up and that made me very depressed, almost suicidal with multiple, mm. like very serious suicide attempts. Oh. Um, thankfully nothing happened. I'm still here, but yeah, it was like a, it was like a cycle of, you know, not eating not knowing what to eat and having those eating disorders, having depression at the same time. And then when you're like that, you have more, you're much more likely to be addicted to food when you're in that mental state. The main thing that got me out of it is when I graduated high school, even though I didn't even go like a lot of the things, ceremonies that they would do, I didn't even go to that because it's like nothing fit. 
and I was depressed mm. and I didn't yeah. want to leave the house, you know? Oh. Um, the moment though that school ended and it was like going to college, my mood got better. Mm. I, I got a job. I was waiting tables, which was so much fun. I, would, I was at, at least making money and I could afford to buy myself clothes and stuff. So that really kind of shifted my mood and I started losing weight. And then when I started um, the bachelor's in nutrition, I do have to say that learning, learning the calories and food, learning that, you know, even if you do have something bad, does it like if it's just a 400 calorie snack, you, you did not destroy everything, you know, mm. just learning yeah. not to like go off the rails, you know, yeah. um, so there is a benefit to that. And all sure. those things helped me. Yeah. But never really like, obviously, that's not what I recommend to just count your calories, but it is important to understand the calories in different foods and stuff. Yeah. So that's kind of like what helped me a lot to get out of it. And then eventually uh, I would say carnivore is the ultimate nail in the coffin. You, you just, you don't have cravings on carnivore because you're not eating addictive foods. So yeah. how, can you, you know, with keto is still struggling because I would still do the keto fun foods. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And how has carnivore diet evolved for you? Like what does your version of carnivore look like? So, um, let's see, I have, so for example, today I had eggs and bacon and, um, I basically just eat ground beef. I feel like every day <laughs> um, last week, like, I feel like in the last two weeks, I've only been doing ground beef, but sometimes like I'll go and, and I'll do ground beef and then salmon and then ground beef and then salmon. But I feel now like it's just ground beef. Um, yeah. it, it shifts, you know, I, I can do chicken wings and chicken thighs that I just don't because they take forever to cook mm. on a pan. Although I guess, I guess I could figure out better ways to do it, but I just feel like ground beef is probably best. So mm. yeah, I did have a carnivore crisp bag of um, chicken skin, for example, as a pre-workout before I ran on my treadmill, Nice, you know, things like that, but yeah. it's pretty boring. <laughs> yeah. 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 And do you, um, you, there's probably like limits on what you can say um, in your professor job, but like, do you do uh, students ever ask Not you about? Students, when students ask you, it, that's what Professor Bartke. You know who Bartke is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I remember when we were being interviewed, or I was one of the collabs we've done together. Yeah. Um, he told me he's like, yeah, but no, you know. It is your right as a professor, if somebody asks you an opinion to say yeah. what you think. And so yeah. that's like protected by law. I was like, really? Mm. I didn't, I didn't double check that. <laughs> <laughs> it's in New Zealand, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. Um, but it's like, that's not my ultimate goal. That's why I don't, I don't do the extra mile to like, oh my God, I'm, you know, so I, I'm yeah. mainly focused on my business. But yeah, it, and, yeah. For as long as I can teach a little bit, I'll, I'll do it for a little while. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's great. I mean, and it's interesting, like if people are curious about it, you can help them, but like, it's not, I find oh, no, it's, it's not. All per- I talk about it. It's not like, oh, you know, okay. I can't help myself. I can't, I can't like just go a whole lecture and tell them that you have to eat your greens and <laughs> yeah. the milk a day. Like, <laughs> insanity. I yeah. give them, I tell them, this is what the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, who, by the way, is in bed with the food companies. This is <laughs> what they put out, but here's why they're wrong. And then, oh my gosh. You know? Yeah. I would love to sit through some of your lectures. <laughs> oh, oh, it's so much fun. It's yeah. So much fun. Sounds awesome. <laughs> and um, I was curious, like, because you mentioned the calorie counting thing. And I think it is really valuable for people to have an awareness of like the calories in different foods and like how many more calories you can get if you're eating something that has like a lot of fat or a lot of carbs and fat. Um, Do you think like for children, where do you think we should even start with like nutrition education? Oh, I think it starts at home. It really does. I don't see how any school system is ever going to, at least in the next few, yeah, like 10 years, there's no way because there's just too much money at stake. There's way yeah. too much money to be made from the cereals and the protein bars and the granola bars, <laughs> and, you know, and yeah. all that money, they come in and they're like, let's support the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics because we are committed to be- bettering the uh, American yeah. health and whatnot, you know? Yeah. So yeah. 
there is no way any kind of um, bureaucratic or organized large organization can ever be at the cutting edge of anything, you know? Yeah. So if you really want to optimize for your health and the health of your kids, you have to take matters into your own hand. And besides like schools, it's, it's not, it doesn't just stop with the food. I mean, it's like everything, you know, I feel like if you can homeschool your kids and take control of what environment you put them in from a young age, yeah. you set them up for success at a very yeah. young age. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And do you like, do you think it's the, like, what do you think the message should be? Like, it, I'll just make this easy. Like if you, if you were teaching your kids about nutrition for the first time, would you be like, Hey, the, like, would you just like focus on, on like animal protein and say like, this is good. Try to have as much of this as possible. Or would you also try to like slowly educate them on like what calories are, what different macronutrients are. And I guess what would be your approach? So I would certainly not give them condensed milk. <laughs> That's, That's number one. <laughs> number two, I would do what Kelly Hogan, I'm sure you know who Kelly Hogan yep, is, right? Of course, yeah. Um, so I, I love that she hasn't introduced sugar to her kids and they don't care about it. Mm. Um, I would, it's, it's a drug. Sugar yeah. is a drug that is six to eight times more addictive than cocaine. It is criminal to introduce it to a child. Mm. You know, just like it is criminal to give them alcohol or tobacco, people all over the world are insufficiently aware to the level or the degree of addictiveness of sugar, mm. not to mention processed food that has sugar and other crap in it, right? And because of this insufficient awareness, we take it casually. We're like, oh, you're being extreme. Come on now, really? This is just yeah. like what a study done in rats well if it's done in rats how come overweight and obese um people when you put them through a brain scan you see the same level albeit slightly less destruction of d2 receptors in their brain as people who are addicted to heroin yeah and cocaine it's crazy right and the more body fat on their frame, there's like a graph that I have in the slides for my students. It's, you can see the graph. It lines up perfectly. The more body fat you have, the less dopamine receptors you have in your brain. You literally are frying your brain. Mm, wow. You know, it's a real addiction. That's crazy. So, yeah. So I'm not playing with that. You know, if I have children or what I would recommend for people who have children, we're not playing. We can't, we cannot take this casually because you don't know. And I'm not saying that all children are going to have the same level of struggle with sugar like I have, because they might struggle more with tobacco or alcohol, depending on their specific um, genetic vulnerabilities and what brain chemical they might be lacking most of. Yeah. Um, but why take that chance? You know, mm -hmm. there is nothing good that's going to come from sugar. There is yeah. no nutrient that we need. There's <laughs> carbohydrate is non-essential, you know? So yeah, I wouldn't play around with that. I wouldn't introduce it at all so that they don't have to have that as a struggle. Let them, let them have other, it's not like I don't want my children to struggle because I think struggle is what really uh, gives us fulfillment mm. when we know how to overcome it. Uh, I would certainly not want to raise trophy babies, but, um, <laughs> you know, but, but let, let's not do it with sugar. We already know this one, you know, let's, yeah. let's do with something else. Yeah. 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 That's really interesting. I mean, clearly struggle has helped you in a lot of ways and you've also been incredibly resilient through a lot of it. Um, I, I would definitely not be in this position if I had not gone through everything. If, if I were, a lot of my friends at school who were given, you know, Jeeps and beautiful cars and the latest phones and an allowance, you know, they're still stuck in Lebanon with, you know, children. They don't, they don't even go to work mm. and, you know, not like there's anything wrong with being at home with children, but, you know, Lebanon is not in a good position right now and they don't have, you know, they don't have opportunities to like to leave or anything. They're, they're just, you know, going through life. Un, in an uninspiring way like, passively me, yeah so for me i feel like my drive and my ambition to constantly like be pushing and doing mm -hmm. everything and you know always having big goals like that all comes from a hunger a hunger that comes from struggling yeah 
That's awesome. And um, it sounds like sugar addiction is one, but are there other nutrition topics or messages you're particularly passionate about um, that you're focusing a lot on? Anti-aging is a big one, um, as I mentioned. Um, so I've, I did, I've, I've done some interviews mainly with the CEO of BioViva uh, company, Liz Parrish, who... Okay is one of the several biotech companies that whose main goal is to cure aging and reframe the aging process as a chronic disease that we can reverse and eventually cure. Mm. And one of my main missions is to drive awareness around this issue because the reason why the FDA and the NIH and our government still, they don't fund anti-aging research is because they don't classify it as a disease. Mm. When the truth is that it is the root cause of all other chronic diseases. Why is it that you don't get heart disease in your 20s? Why is it that you don't get Alzheimer's in your 20s? It is the result of the aging process. And from the small amounts of funding that billionaires and you know people who are aware enough to realize that we can have control over this, the small funding that they're putting into um, private companies to research the aging process, we're seeing mind-blowing results. I mean, mm. just fantastic things. I mean, they were they were able, Dr. David Sinclair at Harvard was able to reverse blindness and rodents um, just because of the of reversing their aging. Because when wow. you reverse aging, stem cells can regenerate destroyed, like damaged um, nerve uh, nerve endings. Cool. Yeah. Um, being an optimal range of vitamin D adds five years to your life. Um, as I mean, there is a test you can do. You can check telomere length to check your biological aging, right? Um, fish oil or not fish oil, having optimal omega-3 status also um, adds or lengthens your telomeres. I would urge everybody to check like why telomere length is an important marker. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to understand. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's so much NAD plus infusions. I mean, mm. I'm just so excited about this stuff. And this is yeah. just us scratching the surface, you know? So if we really take this stuff seriously, it, it is literally a matter of life and death. Yeah. If we don't take it seriously, we are all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> it's as simple as that. Yeah, yeah. You know? So I'm super passionate about this yeah, it's really cool. It'll be very interesting to see what some of the developments are in mm -hmm. anti-aging over the next few decades, and hopefully with with more attention and more funding, to your point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, thank you very much, Dr. Sarah. This has been awesome. Um, I'm definitely going to have to check out more of your interviews on YouTube um, and tell people where they can find you and follow you, and I'll have links in the show notes as well. Awesome. So you can find me everywhere. Um, although I, I have neglected also everywhere except for <laughs> YouTube and Instagram is where I'm really hustling right now. So, okay. um, my YouTube channel is Dr. Um, Sarah with an H Zaldivar mm. and my Instagram is at Dr. Dr. Dot Sarah with an H dot Zaldivar. Um, I'll send you all the links if you can post them in the yep. description box. That way it's easier for people to find me. Mm -hmm. um, also, my website, Um, I do have a Pinterest, a Twitter, a LinkedIn, and a Facebook, wow. which I don't actively like. Maybe the Facebook because everything I post on my Instagram gets yeah, posted on yeah, Facebook automatically. Same. Yeah, yeah. So, but everything else, I haven't been like I, you know, posting regularly everywhere else. Sure. But I'm keeping them because eventually I will. But for now, it's really YouTube and Instagram. Cool. Awesome. I'll have links to all that. And thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much, Scott. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out and share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at CarnivoreCast or go to CarnivoreCast.com. You can also email me at info at CarnivoreCast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.